slide. So from beginning, okay. Okay, Namaskar uh, from Udaipur, Aravalis, uh, to all my all my uh, countrymen. Uh, today I'm very happy to uh, deliver this talk, uh, and thanks to the invitation of ICHR. Uh, actually, I have to thank uh, uh, Jamkhedkar sir, Chairman sir of ICHR, uh, Ratnam ji, Member Secretary, Om ji, uh, uh, Rajesh ji, Jyotsana, Aruna madam, Saurav ji, and Nilesh ji from Deccan College. I, I, I thank all of these authorities from the bottom of my heart for inviting me to deliver this talk on ancient metal making in the Arawis with special reference to Jing. Actually, when uh, when you recollect about the, uh, you know, Rajasthan or Aravalis or Thar Desert, what happens, you know, you generally recollect Thar Desert, which is generally yellowish, and some mountains, maybe camel or something like this. But there is much more beyond beyond these things in Aravalis in Rajasthan to learn. So, uh, you know, it is actually cradle of old cultures, ancient civilizations also, because, uh, you know, uh, when we think about the early man in India, Obviously, men coming from Africa might be coming down to India via Rajasthan and Gujarat itself. So, the very early, you know, there are signatures, thanks to Vian Mishra, work of uh, uh, Kukiji uh, and uh, Murari Lalji, and recently by Ravi uh, in Western Rajasthan, and many others, those who have contributed largely to the Stone Age. And then, you know, we have, uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the uh, India of Rajasthan, the northern part of Rajasthan is, you know, flourished, uh, you know, by the Harappans, also also the on the southern margin, especially in the, you know, at uh, the juncture of Gujarat and Rajasthan. And in between, we have Ganeshwar, Jodhpura culture in the northern aspect, northeastern aspect, and then uh, Ahar culture in southern area, southeastern area particularly. And actually, if you think about this Arauli, which are the one of the oldest you know, rock formations, mountains on the earth. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the Precambrian rocks are visible at number of places in the Aravalis, especially, you know, the impressive, uh, you know, figure at uh, Mount Abu and in the, around Udaipur also. On that Aravalis, on that Precambrian, you know, formation, we have another formation which is popularly known as Delhi group of rocks, which is highly, highly mineralized. And uh, the northern aspect of the Rauli, right from Delhi, where you have this, uh, you know, seven meter tall, world famous, uh, you know, uh, iron pillar, uh, the Rauli mountains start from that Mehroli region down to Ambaji in Gujarat, where again you have a very, you know, important, large uh, copper smelting site. So, in the northern, the northern aspect of Rauli is very rich in copper. You have hundreds of ancient coal working ancient mines and uh, smelting sites in the central part you have lead and in the southern aspect of the Rowleys you have you have lead zinc deposit and actually this is more not only lead zinc copper and iron there are many other metals like gold also in Rajasthan so it is more like polymetallic zone uh, of the world where you know the, the, the ancient mining smelting coal working and has been done by the ancient societies for last seven eight thousand years uh if you if you if you look at this uh this particular uh, uh you know feature in the arawis if you are traveling in the arawis what happens you come across large number of features like this these are actually called gosan by the geologists wherever you have metals in the mountains you do find this kind of you know leaching out in the form of Gosan, and uh, then wherever you have these features, you can easily locate ancient smelting sites, old working sites, or mines, ancient mines around these places. Uh, if you look at this map, actually uh, the Arauli, uh, you know, is diagonally bisects Rajasthan into two parts. The western part is largely hard desert, whereas the eastern part of the Arauli is gorgeous with small seasonal rivers one or two perennial ones and uh, then of course uh, it is quite uh, good conducive good for agriculture etc and uh, uh, you have large number of uh, ancient old workings in the in these arawis right from uh, north to south you can see all these dots representing 
uh, you know, uh, iron, especially red one. So, uh, then you have uh, then you have green one, copper, and you have lead zinc also. So you can see these dots and spread of ancient old workings in the Aravalli. This will give you uh, this can give us good idea how how largely Aravalli has been surveyed by the ancient societies, and uh, you know, metal making was a very very long tradition. If you look at the northern Rajasthan, where I said these the Harappans were flourishing along the Ghagar, especially, and there are a large number of sites they have been discovered, and some of the sites like Kalivanga, Karanpur, Chakete Six, etc., have been excavated by archaeological, especially by archaeological survey of India, and this is one of them, Kalivanga, which is a very famous site where early Harappan and urban phase, which we call Harappan phase, has been discovered, and this is just uh, you know the plan of their fortification and township. And uh, uh, then there is this is this current pool which was recently excavated by uh, our friend Prabhakar ji, and uh, you know uh, from the urban and early early phase we have excellent uh, material that has been reported. This is some of the Soti Siswal kind of material which is very popular in that zone. And these these Harappans in North Rajasthan were surely using large quantity of copper, obviously obtained from the Aravallis, most probably from the Ganeshwar region. And then comes down, if you slightly come down to the northeastern part of uh, uh, Rajasthan, this is Sikar Janjanu uh, area, is is occupied by was it was occupied by the what we uh, what is called as Ganeshwar Jodhpura culture, uh, coined by R C Agrawal and his colleagues in 1970s. And about 25 sites of this culture have been reported from these districts of Jaipur, Sikar, Janjun, etc. And uh, uh, there are a large number of uh, copper old working, copper smelting sites in this region. Uh, some of them look like this. This is a massive, you know, uh, ridge, large ridge of copper slag, which uh, which may have history of last 5,000 years actually. And uh, till 1864. This copper smelting was being operated here. Uh, uh, Captain Brooke, who was a political agent to Rajasthan, was thanks to him because he recorded how copper smelting was being done at this place. And what you see in the in the lower horizon are some you know arrowheads of Ganeshwar culture, copper arrowheads, and exactly identical copper arrowheads are reported from many Harappan sites in. In Haryana, Punjab, and also in uh, Pakistan, in Harappa, at Harappan sites, and also a number of Ganeshwar sites have reported exactly like this. Obviously, these Ganeshwar people they might be supplying these copper objects or ingots to the Harappans, and uh, it has now been chemically uh, proved also that the Ganeshwar was one of the uh, prime location for the Harappans for copper. And this is the sketch you know prepared by my friend Irwin. Actually, this is how. Uh, copper smelting was being operated at Ganeshwar in, in 1864. This uh, must have a very long history. Maybe this is a uh, couple of thousands of years old kind of tradition. Well, uh, when we come down to southern part of uh, southeastern part of Rajasthan, where uh, in the districts of Chittor, Udaipur, Kota, Bundi, Ajmer, and uh, parts of Dumarpur, Banswara, etc., this in this region, this is the southeastern pocket of uh, Rajasthan, where we have evidence of another Bronze Age culture known as Ahar culture, the type site at Udaipur. This particular figure shows this, you know, uh, this green patch of jungle is actually the, 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 the ancient site of Ahar and within this red circle is the site museum of Ahar that was excavated in 1960, 61 by, by H.D. Sankalia, the then director of Deccan College and with the Rajasthan State Government of Archaeology, Department of Archaeology. And what you see in the around this site, roads, etc., and the settlement around, modern settlement, is actually part of ancient site. And this is located on the bank of Ahar. And uh, about 131 sites of this culture in southern Rajasthan have been reported so far. Uh, a couple of sites like Gelon, Balatal, Ahar. Etc. They have been excavated, and excellent evidence uh, has come up. This is uh, the site of Balathal, which was excavated by V. N. Mishra and uh, and uh, his colleague, including Rajasthan Vidyapit. Uh, uh, you know, this was a joint venture uh, for seven years, 1993 to 2000, and this is a, a, a you know a fortified enclosure that was discovered at Balathal, belonging to Ahar culture. 
prior to the discovery of this fortified enclosure of these Bronze Age people 5000 years old, it was generally thought that these hard people or these Bronze Age people in India, whether they were in Deccan, Central India or in Rajasthan, they were living in the huts, you know, they did not know how to raise such massive uh, architecture. But this, this discovery at Balakal changed the perception entirely. You know, they, they became they became like uh, you know uh, harappans. Those 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 who were making the harappans, you know, were the only people did them uh, making fortified enclosures, defense system. So outside the harappan zone, harappan universe, this was the best or first evidence uh, where we have uh, fortified enclosure with uh, paka strong strong base basin uh, on all sides. And uh, what we have beautiful pottery they were using. And some of the pottery, which is also known as reserve sleepwear, they were making, which needs sintering effect. You can see sintering effect in that uh, in that pottery, which is of course not here in the picture right now. But they were they, they are known out of this black and red ware. This is black and red ware, particularly this particular pot. So this black and red ware uh, and the lower one also is the characteristic pottery of this Ahar culture. And these Ahar people, like Ganeshwar ones were highly, highly skillful in making, you know, uh, kind of many kind of metal objects. You can see this is a brass bowl and you have copper uh, axes and variety of copper objects. They are from Balathal, Ahar and uh, the sites. So much like this, these copper cells are from Maharaj Kikedi, very close to the airport. So uh, these people were surely making uh, bronze and copper. So once, once I say bronze, that means, you know, you the people uh, they are mixing two metals copper with something else uh, to copper they are adding something else like tin arsenic lead etc these metals when they are added to copper actually they make copper more ductile flexible and hard also they harden the metal so that becomes more useful so these people 5000 years ago they knew this kind of metallurgy and this tradition continued and these people were doing a lot of trade because of the seal impression seals have been discovered from number of ahar sites and uh, the, the, the major site from Gilun over 100 have been dis discovered by professor sindhi professor Pusel and their colleagues and from ahar and balathal also have been reported so these these seals were uh, being possibly used for trade purpose so uh, uh, Coming out of these bronze age people, when we come to the Iron Age in the Araudi, we do have evidence of what we know as painted graveyard people. Uh, 3000 years ago, they were the uh, early iron using people. We have large number of sites in Bharat, Bharatpur and northern Rajasthan area along the Ghagar also. And then uh, following this, we do have evidence of NBP, northern black polished ware. These were the iron using people and uh, there are large number of sites where iron has been discovered. Well, following this, we have, of course, uh, historic phase. We are not going to discuss, go into detail of the, uh, about these cultures because I have chosen to talk about something else today, what is, what is known as Jink. I chose to do that because Arauli, as I said, is a polymetallic zone and Jink is the special gift from Arauli to the world of science. Therefore, I thought, uh, I must say, whatever I know, whatever is uh, available from this, this zone of Aravali. This jig is a non-ferrous metal. Actually, it is, it is volatile because what happens, you know, when you heat copper or iron or ferrous metals, the, the, the outcome would be in the form of slag or, you know, in semi-liquid uh, form but or solid or semi-liquid. But in case of gin, what happens if you heat zinc, it gets lost. So it is very difficult to smell zinc. Therefore, people in southern Rajasthan, for the first time in the world, they were able to smell uh, zinc and make, uh, make you know, metallic zinc. So uh, therefore, this is a very, very important metal. And if we uh, try to understand uh, how this zinc was being used, actually, early zinc was being used for making brass, but brass can be made without even making metallic zinc because you know most of the ores they have some impurities when ores with impurities they are smelted there may be some uh, some metal which you know uh, comes in so in that case the brass an intentional brass can be made i will explain this later on when we go to the brass section but then uh, let me go 
take you to Jawar right now. This is the location of Jawar in the Aravalis in southern Rajasthan, very close to Udaipur. And this is in, the, in an area very close to Ahar, where uh, you know uh, experience of metallurgy or traditional metallurgy exists for the last 5,000 years. In the same area uh, at Jawar, lots of ancient mines are there and uh, people produced zinc as, at industrial scale, pure zinc at industrial commercial scale for the uh, last 800 years. I'm sure for many more uh, 100 years, uh, evidence must be there, is there. We have yet to identify it. which one is the older than 12th century AD. This is a panoramic view of Java. Uh, you know, uh, this area is composed again by the, uh, you know, undulating formation of Arauli, where we have the daily group of rocks on top and which are uh, actually uh, house of this ores and minerals. This is again the same view. And what you see in the foreground are few temples. Actually, this entire area is dotted with ancient Jains and Brahminic temples and uh, large number of remains of ancient settlements in this area. Uh, also heaps, massive heaps of uh, refractory material. When I say refractory, that means material that was used for smelting and then it was discarded. That is called refractory material. So uh, most of these temples are bracketed between uh, 10th and 15th century or 16th century AD and uh, uh, there are temples built, uh, you know, are, apart from temples you do have lots of habitation sites. This entire area of Java is actually located on the bank of TD, a river which is uh, ultimately joining Som. It is the catch, catch, catchment area of Som which uh, entirely, uh, ultimately eventually goes down to Gujarat. And uh, this is the you know area of Java in the Toko Sheet actually. So not to go into detail, the, uh, they, they actually this discovery of Java, the idea of Java, you know, as a, as, a, as a metal making was there in 60s, in 1960s when Srikantan and others geologists, they worked here. And uh, uh, the, when the Britishers were around, they tried their best to restart the smelting, uh, you know, jinx smelting at Java, but they miserably failed due to problem of water or other things. But this new discovery happened about Jawar in 1982-83 when uh, people like H.P. Paliwal, the then director of Hindustan Jink, who was standing in this, in this right picture with the black coat and black trouser, is uh, Harihar Paliwal. Next to him is Paul Kadaw. Next to him is famous archaeologist KTM Hegre. And next to him is Professor Krishnan from Baroda. And then finally, Professor Ajit Prashad, and in the left picture you have uh, Professor uh, uh, Sumavane, Professor Bahan, Ajit, and Brenda Kadok, wife of Paul Kadok. These people, and this is the first discovery of a smelting furnace at Java in 1982-83. And thanks to these people, they were uh, uh, they were lucky to discover these furnaces, and uh, they were very very lucky to discover such uh, a, a bank of seven uh, furnaces at Java. And then they continued studies, and uh, then other people joined later on. So, um, so in in one such furnace, th this is a bank of six, seven furnaces they opened. This is furnace one, furnace two, and they are in in, in a series. And the furnace, unlike your copper or iron, the furnace has two parts. Here, one is you know uh, the, the retorts are kept in the upper chamber of the furnace, and there is a perforated plate, and there is a lower chamber. So perforated plate is kept upside down and uh, uh, in each furnace, in, uh, there were 36 retorts. So altogether in seven furnaces, there were 252 retorts they discovered. And in the lower chamber, the vapor was collected, it was condensed. And then uh, finally, uh, zinc was obtained. So uh, in this picture, what you see are huge heaps of you know, uh, soil. Actually, this is not soil, this is the you know, when uh, zinc was mined, it was crushed, it was roasted. After roasting, the, the, the impurities were separated. This is the result of roasting and vinification at Jawar. So there are many, many such heaps at Jawar indicating that it was a very long tradition of making uh, zinc at Jawar because such heaps, you know, would take years, centuries to, to become like this. So. One thing we have to remember that the, the, the Java smiths, the metallurgists at Java, they use distillation technique to make zinc. I'll explain this later on when I show, show you the furnaces. Uh, well, this, these are uh, grinding actually 
this was the grinding place of ore in the rocks itself. There are many, many such places on, on the hills of uh, Jawar where they made such, you know, uh, areas where, you know, they, they grinded the ore. Grinding was done, pounding was done, and ore was separated from the impurities, and then it was roasted. Well, this is the uh, contour map of Java. The shaded area shows the ancient mining area, uh, Mochia, and then uh, you have Java Mala, Baroi Mala, and this in this very area where the ancient mining was done, in this very area was also done ancient mining, and the ancient mining was done up to a depth of 150 meters from the surface. And what you see here, dots actually along the TD River, there, these are the uh, ancient sites or uh, remains of ancient settlement, temples, etc., which you saw in the previous slides. So this entire area of Jawar is actually composed of what I said, Delhi group of rocks. And in Delhi group of rocks, something is called lower Arauli, middle and upper Arauli. In this middle Arauli, you have uh, rocks like dolomites, quartzite, phyllites, etc. Uh, carbonate association primarily and uh, you do have brevet also with this you have lead zinc and iron okay so uh, now the, the, the ore is in the form of lenses or veins something like this what you see here signing part is, is actually lead and the zinc which is sphalerite so uh, we don't have calamine here we have sphalerite ore of zinc which is slightly purple or brownish in color and quite uh, distinct and visible in with the naked eyes and people were able at Java to separate it from lead. Okay, so if you look at the ancient mining in the in the area of southern Rajasthan, uh, in uh, you know, in area of Java, Dariba or in Bhilwada, Abucha, you have incredible evidence the ancient mining was done up to a depth of 262 meters below surface. It is beyond imagination, 262 meter means, you know, below the water table people were mining. How the air was being supplied, how light was being supplied, how they were able to bring out that metal to such a long distance uh, is, is beyond imagining. And uh, somewhat similar, they were also doing at Dariba and Jawar. They were doing both surface mining and subsurface, underground mining, deep underground mining. So this mining technology must have uh, had taken a very long time to reach to this level. So this uh, evidence which I'm saying is coming from Borean times onwards or 2000 years old. These are some of the old mines, open mines. This is a mine named after Mahana Pratap at Jawar, and you have also stairs leading to the ancient mine. Uh, well, uh, there are there are other mines also which we which kings started in this area like this is one of the summer Singh's uh, inscription uh, uh, which says that he he raised mining in 14th century AD. this is one uh, ancient mine inside your fort at Jawar, which is now closed so this is 20 years old picture when i was surveying at Jawar. well this is uh, you know how ancient mining has been done people did start cutting right from surface on top and then uh, ventilation was created, edits were created, then the stopes were created, and uh, from the working saps, they, they were taking out material, and uh, in the edits, they were actually dumping the uh, debris or galleries they made where they were dumping the debris, and stopes they were they made for air and uh, actually primarily for air. So this is how the vertical uh, mining has been done, and there are large number of subsurface mines, uh, incredible ones. I'll show you in the coming slide. This is a stope, which is about the diameter of which is about one meter visible on the surface. This is kind of ventilation actually for air. This is Mauryan mine uh, about 150 meters below the surface at Jawar Mala. And uh, this mining was done by fire setting at, at Jawar because lots of soot have been discovered and it has been dated uh, properly. So uh, what happens, you know, when when people were doing fire sitting, they were they were dumping a lot of wood at number of places and they were uh, getting fire and to heat the rocks. So when they, they were doing this, so there may be, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of, you know, smoke in, in the mine. So people had to run to save their life. And the, the, the uh, Britishers, they have recorded that many casualties, ha casualties happened uh, while doing this because uh, when they are lit fire, immediately the mine would be full of smoke and people might die. 
so they had to run to save their life immediately out out of the mine coming about 100 meter or 200 meter out of the mine may have been a incredible incredibly difficult job so but this fire setting has a very long history because even baramir has reported this he he he, he, uh, he writes that the fire setting was a very very popular uh, kind of you know a technique out of his mining rocks were broken and then mining was done even this is still common in the villages across the landscape in india my friend uh, arvind has uh, prepared this sketch uh, you know based on the literature available or mines available how mining may have been done at jawar because the uh, underground in the underground mine subsurface on the surface is fine but when you are doing underground mine not only light not only air but also light is also equally important because you know there will be dark so at the risk of your life people were doing all this so uh, so perhaps mining was done something like this uh, uh lin willis paul kadok and their team they have uh, recorded uh, you know how ancient mining was done what is this you know uh, uh, plan of that ancient mining at jawar so uh, so uh, but now it is impossible to go inside uh, these are mauryan mines at jawar what you find in in these mines are you know you have ladders you have uh, uh, you know uh, uh, ancient wooden ladders actually they have been dated and they turn out to be uh, belonging to mauryan phase this is a launder in in one of the ancient mine which was used for transporting water so uh, there must have been you know lot of problem of water you know in the ancient mines so people did manage it extremely well what has been found from these mines was you know are some uh, iron objects they were surely used for mining for digging and breaking rocks etc also was found uh, you know a, a, a wooden uh, basket like this they they were they might have been used for transporting ores from the mines so these bamboo baskets have been also dated and uh, turns out to be a mauryan one and uh, this is the time of terracotta pots like this uh, actually these terracotta pots are typical mauryan shapes so uh, radiocarbon dates terracotta pots and uh, you know wood uh, radiocarbon dates for wood etc all turn out to be uh, mauryan so the mining starts from mauryan and continues till uh, 16th 17th century even till uh, 18th century it continues continues there sorry 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 i have to go back okay this is a general view of ancient mining at jawar how what was happening there so uh, this is a busy day inside the mine uh, what you see here people are you know uh, some people are bringing wood some are moving up and down carrying material in the basket some people are carrying water you know you can see a launder here people are you know uh, this water is coming it is being collected and people are some people are taking it out so and some people are mining so the ore is being taken uh, out of the mine so uh, it's, it's 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 a kind of teamwork without a team uh, without a good management this cannot happen well this is a uh, open mine at jawar there are a large number of open mine actually on almost all the hills you have open mines at jawar people have uh, extremely uh, surveyed extremely well all the uh, mountains there these are all open mines at jawar visible here and there in, uh, at this place this is a open mine at dariba very large open mine where the material is uh, you know uh, uh, finally after digging so much the material uh, you know debris must be uh, coming inside so they prepared a kind of wooden uh, you know um, uh, structure to hold that material when this wooden material was dated so this uh, this turn again turned out to be mauryan phase or belonging to the mauryan times so uh yes is something like this so uh you know the 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 arth shastra kautilya mentions that there was a director of mines during the mauryan times and he had to be expert on identifying ores and he also should have you know idea of chemical properties of um, uh, you know ores and also medicinal properties of ores so this is incredible that you know Uh, during the mauryan times uh, people uh, had this kind of idea of metallurgy or uh, ores well uh, also kautilya arshastra uh, also records that uh, you know it is very important akar prabhav kosha kos kosha danda prajayate prithvi kosha danda bhyam prapyate kosha bhushan very important citing actually 
minds are source of treasury from the treasury power comes to state and the earth whose ornament is treasury acquired by means of army and treasury so if you do not do this then uh, you, your state become may become weaker so again it says whatever profit you are earning from from the mines should be reinvested in the mines for maintenance so that then only profit will come so uh, that means uh, you know the, the, there was extremely well maintenance of the ancient mines so that means mining was a state business well uh, what is interesting is that uh, at jagar there was a treasury during the, the when the zinc was being extracted uh, what we have discovered you know there are large number of uh, uh, archival records available at udaipur in the city palace at udaipur where it's talk about a treasury at jagar and the treasury had this kind of record you know what was kept in different bags in the treasury this particular record shows and there are a large number of like this so uh, now now this is kind of perfect example what cortelia said jawar seems to be appears to be a perfect example where you know treasury was there mining was being done and ancient mines may have been you know maintained and the investment may have been uh, done by the kings so who were those kings these were the maharanas of uh, mewar state they then mewar state and the um, uh, you know some of the maharana names in these records is legible like jagat singh maran raj singh jay singh first amar singh sangram singh jagat singh second pratap singh second raj singh hari singh amir singh maran bhim singh all these kings were maintaining this treasury at jawar so this is the uh, plan of the ground plan of the fort at jawar in the central part of this fort you have a very strong building possibly this was the treasury at jawar uh, when this this zinc uh, production was happening these are the remains of that treasury uh it was fort at jawar and uh, this is one of the entrance to the fort well inside the fort there is a sun icon uh, belonging to uh, early medieval phase uh, and it is being worshiped as holika by the local villagers so uh, uh, if you look at the chronology of mining at jawar especially so it starts from the uh, mauryan phase and continues down to medieval and post medieval phase also initially it appears to be on small scale but it gradually it widens and the last scale large scale mining and smelting has been done on commercial scale actually uh well uh, if you look at uh, the epigraphic evidence from jawar the, you know uh, during 4th century ad jawar was known as srivangiri during 13th 14th century it was known as samnagar it the samnagar word also comes in the local uh, records during 14th century jawar was also known as yoginipur or yogini pattan yogini pattan is a word which is pattan is suffixed to a, a word which means you know a place from where trade was being organized or operated during 17th century onwards the name jawar comes into picture well how this smelting was done what what people did this is you know purely innovation at jawar when they devised A, a very peculiar, very interesting zinc smelting furnace. This it is a it is a rectangular, 69 centimeter by 69 centimeter squarish furnace with uh, with uh, you know with a terracotta plate, perforated terracotta plate into four parts, and these four parts were joined together and kept on a on a on a, on a uh, terracotta stick. It was supporting, and this this were joining, and this it was finally placed on top. And how this you can see this uh, this stick you know in the actual evidence here and uh, this is the profile of those uh, bottles terracotta bottles uh, which look like brinjal kept upside down in the in the perforated plate uh, and they, they 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 their mouth opens in the lower chamber and the furnace in the upper chamber fire was given i mean lots of fuel was uh, placed up uh, on top of these uh, these retorts brinjal like musas or retorts where fire firing was done and the, the vapor you know ultimately vapor was generated which came to the lower chamber and finally the zinc was obtained so this is this this uh, furnace may have looked something like this and it was opened here this is uh, prodox uh, uh, imagination so uh, i just to uh, just to make you recollect uh, this perforated plate and the same furnace here 
Well, uh, Kadok, uh, this is a sketch prepared by Brenda Kadok, wife of Paul Kadok, uh, how these furnaces may have looked like and how people may have been working at Java. So this, uh, this uh, not only furnace, but also the bottles, the retort, which looked, which is called a musha, or which is, uh, this retort, retort was also made in two parts, lower part of the retort bottle, body of that, and uh, then you have a cap. The cap has a, has a pipe, a nozzle, a long pipe, which is uh, which was 13 centimeter long. And it, uh, after crushing the core, I mean roasting, the core was grinded. After grinding, it was, you know, the cow dung was mixed to it. And small balls were prepared. And these balls were inserted in the bottle, in, in this body, actually. And once it was filled, then, uh, then the cap, uh, you know, was looted to it. And finally, a uh, uh, finally a small thin uh, wooden stick was inserted in the pipe uh, through this nozzle through this pipe up to the end of the bottle so when this was that uh, when the heat was given this terracotta uh, wooden this wooden stick would burn and the carbon monoxide you know uh, would form so right from end to end or and then the vapor would come out uh, when the temperature was maintained from 1000 to uh, 1100 degrees. So what is the summary of this entire process was uh, mining was done, then benefication of ore was done, roasting was done, grinding of ore was done, then mixing it with cow dung, cow, so, uh, raw cow dung actually. And then uh, maybe some other, sometime other agents may have also been mixed as the literature says. Uh, then preparation of small balls filling in the bottle, inserting wooden stick, diluting the cap and placing in the furnace. So once this happened uh, uh, the heat was given for five to six hours the temperature maintained was 1000 to 1100 degrees what is important and interesting here is zinc has a very low smelting temperature just 400 degrees but it can you know uh, the melting point of zinc is 915 degrees and if you want vapor from this zinc then the temperature has to go over 1000 degrees then only your vapor would come out. Other and if you can trap that vapor, condense that vapor, then only pure zinc or metallic zinc would come out. Otherwise, it will re-oxidize. So therefore, it was a very difficult metal to handle. In the ancient text, you know, lots of uh, uh, you know uh, material uh, reducing material agents were mixed with ore like borax, ghee, treacle, salt, nosadar, earthworms, wool, turmeric, uh, plum. Cashew nut, cow dung, etc. Uh, actually, these were reducing agent when zinc was made by by on uh, by the people on very small scale, preferably for using for medicinal purpose. So this is description of that. But when it was uh, when it, it was uh, created or it was the production was done at a very large scale, maybe all adding all these things may have been difficult. But it is quite likely that cow dung is a very very common reducing agent which uh, people may have added to uh, to the ore to smelt. Then how the retorts or bottles of musas were made, this is the first time we have discovered a complete retort from Jawar which is 34 centimeter uh, you know long. Out of this this tank this pipe is 13 centimeter long and and rest is uh, 24 uh, centimeter. So Ras Ratna Samuchai, very well known alchemical text of 13th, 14th century, uh, you know, clearly explains how this, uh, this, this retorts were prepared. Prepare a brinjal shaped musa with 12 angul, 12 finger long, two fixed over it uh, like an inverted bhattura flower, make a hole at the height of eight angula in the tube. This is used for extraction of stow. Stow means actually zinc. Uh, metallic zinc or vapor actually from the soft drug like carpur. So this has been published in the Indian National Science Academy volume. This uh, translation has been actually published so uh, uh, it can be accessed. Uh, Brenda Kadok has prepared another sketch from Jawar how this uh, smelting may have been uh, under operation, how people may have been working and uh, also, you know, uh, Rasratta Samuchya explains how this zinc smelting was done. So uh, I have already, uh, you know, explained the furnace types and uh, reducing agents. So uh, when the heat was given, 
then what happens it reads the text reads when the flame issuing from molten calamine changes from blue to white so people those who were hitting these uh, the, the smelting zinc at java they must be constantly observing the the flame of the furnace when it was you know they had to maintain that temperature when it was changing from blue to white the crucible is caught hold by means of pair of tongs so this is the description is primarily for laboratory scale not for it may be for medicinal purpose not for laboratory scale like not for commercial scale like java but the flame the observation of the flame is very very important here which text records so the crucible is caught hold by means of pair of tongs but in that case the 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 pipe was not broken that is very important and that means in the pipe there must be the essence of zinc so they therefore they they avoid they avoided breaking the the nozzle part of the retort the other part of it was they did not care for it well at java what you see massive dumps of dumping of uh, episodes of this uh, refractory material what you see in the picture here uh, this is for uh, last 800 years at java there are many many heaps like this so uh, i mean there is no second opinion about saying that this was a commercial production not a short scale production and the crock and his team thinks that this is about 600 uh, tons of uh, refractory material at java uh, you can see different episodes of that refractory material this is mostly uh, the bottles broken bottles and fragments of furnaces well uh, sometimes uh, what people did at java uh, you know after the retorts were exhausted sometimes they reused the retorts as bricks to make their houses who perhaps possibly the smiths or the miners those people were living at java they raise their houses like this so these are actually uh, this is very important evidence we should all uh, this should all be preserved uh, well uh, this is one of the dumping uh, in the circle at java huge dumping of refractory material at java there are many many uh, dumping like this uh, well uh, what happened uh, uh, last year Uh, somebody at Jawar in one of the uh, large heap was cut, destroyed by the local villagers. They were raising a house. You can see the house is under construction. So uh, uh, we were uh, informed by Arvin, uh, our friend over there, that you know a, smel a smelting furnace is uh, has got exposed in the section. So we immediately contacted the Archaeological Survey of India, obtained uh, permission to to do salvage work here. so uh, i uh, took all my students from the department and we started uh, you know uh, uh, exposing this properly and collected all the material of the furnaces exposed the furnaces at jawar so uh, this is the close up of the furnaces became visible in the uh, destroyed section exposed section at jawar but you see all the refractory material dumping of all the refractory material but in between the, the, there are remains of furnaces well uh, this is the uh, view from top what we found you know uh, uh, two different levels uh, remains of furnaces below but ab above you have again you know floors three floors so actually there may have been furnaces furnaces like this uh, up here also the those furnaces have already gone but what we have floors of the furnaces properly plastered so in which actually metallic zinc zinc may have been uh, Uh, you know after the vapor was condensed metal zinc may have occurred here and it must have been that must have been collected from this floor the floors were properly prepared of course uh, large cracks have happened in course of time uh, in the in the in the lower part we discovered remains of uh, uh, you know three furnaces only in two we we, we could recover a couple of uh, retorts so on the right side is the plan of those furnaces they they were open on one side and uh, we 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 have uh, prepared this drawing this was the picture uh, uh, of the furnace we exposed at java it has again 36 retorts but some of uh, them have gone well something like this so the same thing uh, the entire furnace was squarish and it has four uh, uh, plates joined together and they were supported by a a uh, stick like this now what is interesting is that i am again repeating the same bank of seven furnaces here because now uh, what is most important that you know we have for the first time discovered this uh, complete retort from this furnace now this this uh, perforated plate is about 6 meter centimeter thick 
and this nozzle is 13 centimeters. So out of this 13 centimeter, six centimeter is is within this uh, you know uh, space, and then remaining seven centimeter would go below in the lower chamber. So in the lower chamber, in the seven centimeter area, the condensation was done. So what has happened? Why it is important that the temperature in upper chamber where the heat was given for five to six hours and the temperature was maintained 1000 to 11 de 1100 degree that temperature within this within this six to seven centimeter area or say in totality it was about 13 centimeter area the temperatures were brought down less than 400 degree uh, and the vapor uh, initially it must have been in the liquid form while coming dropping from top and gradually coming down and finally that 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 liquid form must have converted into vapor and finally the uh, once it came out it came out in the form of powder in the lower chamber so it is quite likely that many many furnaces many times this experiment may have failed they might have failed but how they achieved this is very interesting this is downward distillation technique this downward distillation technique was actually used by the liquor making. I'll show you in the coming slides. So the Karshma at Jawar happened within this 13 centimeter or within 7 centimeter area of this lower chamber, which is visible here in this slide or in the lower part of the retort. Generally, in most of the cases, the lower part of this retort or this, this funnel or this pipe is generally missing. We don't find this. Uh, we think that, you know, the essence, the zinc, which was, you know, in the vapor form initially, when, when, when it was traveling down, uh, the vapor was traveling down, ultimately converting into powder. Actually, some part of zinc may have been there inside the, uh, the pipe also. When the pipe was broken, it may have again used. It is quite likely, it's quite possible. But the charisma people at Jawar did this temperature from 1000 degree to 400 degree, they managed, it was a charisma. They, that happened for the first time in the world, anywhere in the world on the earth at Jawar. Uh, there is Paka evidence from 12th century AD to early 19th century AD. AD but there, there, since I have been, uh, you know, right from beginning of my presentation, I'm saying that the, 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 the jinx mining started uh, from Mauryan times. So surely they must be smelting uh, jinx right from Mauryan time at Jawar. But where is the evidence that we have yet to research? So. So I wanted to, through this presentation today, I wanted to show this important evidence from Jawar. Uh, now, uh, the archaeometrologists who have worked on Jawar and otherwise also in the country, many of us, we think that perhaps in, in, this idea was given by Paul Pedock also that the Koshi type furnaces, which were uh, given, explained in the ancient alchemical text, they were uh, perhaps the idea of Jawar must have been derived from these Koshi type furnaces. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, across the country, uh, people make liquor, country liquor, using downward distillation. And this downward dist idea of downward distillation, uh, the history goes back to the Mauryan times. We have uh, a, a excellent evidence from Takshashila for this downward distillation and uh, uh, for liquor making primarily. So this liquor making of ancient time was translated for, uh, you know, uh, jinx melting. Distillation, uh, downward distillation for jinx melting. So uh, this laboratory scale was translated into commercial scale by those people at Jawar. Uh, this was, I think, uh, the, the best gift people from Jawar, those whom we call uh, tribals, illiterate, uh, gift given by them to the country. So, uh, uh, you know, in the year 19, 1736, William Champion from uh, Bristol, England, he prepared, he was doing a brass business. On the left side, it is industry here. He prepared a, 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 a jinx melting uh, factory, a jinx melting you know, uh, furnace at uh, Bristol, exactly on the same principle of Java. Uh, of course, his, 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 his bottle is quite big compared to Java, but the same principle, uh, downward distillation. And here, he, the, 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 the vapor is being collected, condensed in water. So uh, we do not know how William Champion learned this Java technique, who translated this to William Champion and how and they do not recognize it. And by 1738, 
जिंक स्मेल्टिंग ऑपरेशन वॉज पेटेंटेड बाई गवर्नमेंट ऑफ यू नो ग्रेट ब्रिटेन मेटल विच नो वन न्यू इन यूरोप ऑन द कंट्री इन इंडिया इट वॉज नोन फ्रॉम ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी एटी एंड फ्रॉम इंडिया इट वॉज बींग ट्रांसपोर्टेड इट वॉज बींग एक्सपोर्टेड दिस इज चाइनीज जिंक मेकिंग टेक्निक uh called uh, you know uh, it is recorded in tengugu like kaivu in 17 uh, 1637 uh, uh prior to 1637 jink was not known in uh, china of course from 1521 uh jink uh, starts increasing in their coins and gradually they started making jink and started uh, exporting it via india via india to uh, europe and jink in china was known uh, after the indian name actually tutenal well uh, these are some of the radiocarbon dates from jawar for mining and smelting uh, uh, ranging from modern times down to early 19th century there are large number of inscriptions in the temples in jain and hindu temples some of them also read uh, muslim names like akbar and aurangzeb also and uh, uh, a uh, a puranic king prahlad is also associated, associated with jawar this is cave of prahlad at jawar i do not know what is the relationship of, of this puranic uh, uh, mythological king prata prahlad with uh, smelting or especially with jink smelting there are some coins they were they were discovered by gurjar from uh, you know a, a filling of a dam uh, in a pot they belong to the period of akbar there are silver coins basically and perhaps these coins indicate that you know due to business these coins might have arrived at jawar well uh, from the furnace now uh, what we saw in the furnace there were 36 retorts in each retort 1 kg of charge could be accommodated and out of which 400 gram of zinc was produced so in one furnace in one shot 25 to 30 kg of zinc was prepared and Uh, 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 about 600 ton uh, 100000 tons of smelting debris at jawar is has been uh, estimated and prodok and his team thinks that about 32000 tons of zinc was produced in just 400 years if that is for 14 to 1800 ad but if we stretch it for 12th century ad to 19th century ad early 19th century ad when finally zinc production ceased around 1812 so that would be the, the amount would double obviously it would go beyond 50000 tons there are large number of archival records uh, uh, include I, i have already shown you some but uh, archival records also register that jawar was the main source of revenue for the state of mewar uh, this this particular uh, uh, bahi lalchandri bahi from of 1691 become some of 1691 reads that About two thousand fifty lakh, two lakh fifty thousand Jawar rupee sisa sisa jasadri khan rawaras. I mean, and per day it was seven hundred rupees. Another one also reads about the same, almost same amount, two thousand two lakh forty nine thousand forty two rupees. So Jawar was a very very prominent, important source of revenue for kings in Mewar. And uh, some of the epigraphic information uh, from early fourteenth century. uh speaks that business people like jain traders uh, were coming to jain pra- traders from karnat karnataka madhya pradesh madhya desh madhya pradesh takka punjab lat that was known as gujarat were coming to udaipur perhaps for metal trades maybe silver and zinc from jawar there are also references for uh akshpattalika akshpattalika are called accountants so uh, the, the local records very well mentioned that jawar was a very large settlement thousands and thousands of people of different communities they were living at jawar and uh, uh, these records also explain that you know jawar was also known as samnagar uh, for some time it was uh, known after uh, king samar singh from 1250 ad so so uh, clearly records you know how ancient mines were any was being done and not only uh, not only uh, zinc but also lead being produced from jawar so uh, 
in one of the hill there is a very strong building uh, only remains have uh, are surviving now and that building uh, according to the local legend belongs to vela banya a, a trader a trader who uh, perhaps was operating this this metal business perhaps it is really residence for him at a very safe place at jawar so same 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 uh, same place well uh, if you look at the trade uh, there is a very interesting record coming from public office record london 1509 uh in that record divavius an alchemist of holland received indian zinc in 1597 from a friend which he calls peculiar kind of indian tin or malabar malabar lead actually that time in europe people did not know what is zinc indians have long been in possession of this method of extracting pure zinc from the ore at least in course of last century this metal has been brought from thence to europe so this is one of the interesting evidence that is coming from london about the trade of zinc then what is interesting is in in europe or also in china uh, you know zinc was also known as tutena which is indian name why in china and europe uh, unless and until it goes from india how people would know otherwise from jengius mentions in, uh, the, the importation of zinc from india in 1647 in his famous book called de minerabilis uh china also records tutenak as i already showed you in tengung kaibu in 1637 so how this word travels to china it is even possible that chinese learned this technique that is even possible but instead of downward distillation they did upward distillation so because china has a very long tradition of spirit making maybe they have slightly different uh, you know uh, tradition of their different technique of spirit making rather than downward distillation of india so they might have translated it into that way well this is chinese these are chinese ingots why are india they were being exported uh, in early 19th century by this time in 1812 uh, you know uh, the, the production at jawar has ceased uh, todd records that 1812 was the last person who knew how to make zinc at jawar well uh, this is bidri ware from south india uh, belonging to 15th century Uh, in which zinc has been used and uh, on the right side they, these are some uh, coins from himachal pradesh called known as jittel coins uh, they are made of zinc uh, well uh, now uh, let me uh, discuss little a bit about brass because as i said earlier uh, brass has much longer history than zinc now why i am discussing brass because zinc was primarily used for making brass in ancient india so uh, uh, you know uh, brass can be made in many ways uh it can be uh, you know when i am saying brass it is a it is a brass is an alloy of zinc and copper so uh if percentage of zinc is less than 4% in brass that means it is accidental people did not know there is zinc in the ore they just smelted it and uh, some amount of zinc has already come as impurity in the brass but if it is more than 4% obviously in that case people intentionally smelted a particular ore to have certain kind of seen in the brass and then this is called uh, intentional one but if uh, the percentage is uh, around uh, between 22 and 28% in that case it is the zinc is prepared by cementation process but if the percentage of zinc goes beyond more than 33% in brass in that case it is surely surely metallic zinc mixed with copper to make brass the earliest example of this brass comes from takshila dating back to pre mauryan times uh, a time when uh, actually romans arrived in in takshila uh, in 3rd century bc uh, uh, late 4th century bc actually so there was a village uh, at takshila from where brass has been discovered so early brass examples of early brass come from a harappan site called lothal in gujarat then from hastinapur atranji khida in up takshila i have already uh, explained then there is another site in uh, lower ganga valley called senuar then there are uh, evidence so in the historic times from a uh, buddhist uh, biharas nalanda timargar graves then there are brass coins from gutta phase there are a large number of you know medieval brass making centers in, at, in gujarat and some other places so this is the chemical uh, result of this takshila brass which 34.34 Three four. That means you know more. This is more than thirty three percent. It means it was uh, you know metallic zinc added to copper to make brass. So our people two thousand more than two thousand years ago knew metallic zinc 
and they were uh, using it for making bras and also they were using it for medicinal purpose. This is evidence from Sinwar again. Here you have this 35% from Sinwar. Well, this is a brass, uh, you know, a cannon at Udaipur, uh, where brass, you know, zinc was <laughs> available easily. So people use even making cannon. So uh, because, you know, a zinc is a corrosion resistant metal. Therefore, it is used in many industries. Also, you, you might be remembering, you know, on, on most of your doors, especially in northern India, uh, you, your, your, your door locks are prepared uh, out of brass simply because it is corrosion resistant and uh, it has very long life. Uh, therefore, therefore, it is called yasad. Yasad means which has, has a very, very yes, which gives you, uh, you know, uh, fame and has a long life. So there are some 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 brass utensils. Actually, brass has been recorded very well in ancient literature, uh, uh, right from Vedic to to Materia Medica. Like this is example coming from Charak Samhita, Siddhisthanam, which records many metals, including brass, like uh, gold, silver, copper, bronze, iron, etc. Or another example from Charak Samhita, which uh, which uh, you know uh, explain zinc also, which Sukla and Tripathi has translated into this way. Let me read out uh, the English part. Vasma, powder of metal, soviranjana, uh, uh, perhaps made of lead sulfide, tutham. Uh, this is this tutham word is very similar, very close to tutena, pure tutia, gold, pure mansil, uh, venkuthali, bule, iron, and pospanjana are mild in taste and good for curing eyes. The word pospanjana of the text has been interpreted as white surma or flower of jasta or rasak. So this is this translation has been done by Sukla and Trapati. Of course, we have to confirm this with material also, metal also. And um, there are there are other textual references like from Arthasastra, Ayurvedic texts from Rastatnakara of Nagarjuna, which is which is believed to be 1400 years old. Then Rasnava Rastvarnam about 800 years ago. Then Rastata Samuja I have already discussed 700 years ago. Then uh, all these texts. Uh, apart from these Chinese, Persian, British, Greek, all they talk about brass. There are a lot of literary references for brass. It is known as Arkut, Riti, Ritika, Pital, Birinj in Indian literature, and Jink is known as Pospanjana, Stav, Padan, Rasak. Rasak is of three different kinds Mritika Rasak, Gud Rasak, Pushpasan Rasak, and Kharpur. So Jink has different names. Uh, also, known as Jasad or Yasad. This Jasad or Yasad term comes only after 14th century AD. Well, uh, then there is the Tutena word, which is popular in China and also in European literature. I don't need to go into detail about this. Uh, there are a number of sites in the world where Jink was claimed right from prehistoric time, like Athenian Agora, Telgazer in West Asia, Abuda, Argentina, Namazga, Depe, uh, in Central Asia, uh, Bern, Switzerland, British sales, and in China also. But all these turned out to be fake, except for a, an example from Asia Minor and Takshil. Uh, well, uh, Bhav Prakash Nigantu, a text of 16th century, very, very important text, uh, uh, explains that, that brass and alloy of copper and zinc is known as Pitala, Arkut, Ar, Riti. It is of four different types, Rajariti, Brahmariti, Kapila, and Pingala. Four different ty types of brass has been explained. Pittalam, Tuar, Kutam, Syadaro, Ritish, Kathyate, Rajariti, Brahmariti, Kapila, Pingala, Picha. So it is extremely uh, uh, based on properties. It has been properly explained how different kinds of brass was prepared in India. And it has prepared a uh, fairly long history uh, like Romans. Uh, in ancient history of science and technologies and literature, there is a uh, quote from uh, R.J. Forbes, eminent uh, European historian of science in 1964. His writing uh, reads, it seems that zinc was prepared by Indian chemists since 12th century, century, but this remained a laboratory scale experiment and was never applied to industrial production. So now uh, all of you have seen uh, the area visited Jawar now. Uh, it was. It cannot be stated as a as a laboratory scale. It was industrial or commercial scale. So this is you know evidence of Eurocentrism. So this has to be discarded, refuted. Well, uh, all this evidence of Jawar was despite uh, you know patenting by England 
it was accepted by Royal Society London. It was accepted by uh, you know uh, American Society of Metal also. Royal Society London uh, in his in his uh, writing says the technical sophistication and application of scientific principles are unparalleled elsewhere in the medieval period. About Java, it writes the elements of standardization and mass production foreshadow the industrial revolution. This is the earliest example of high temperature distillation operation. It's very important. So uh, this 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 gift to the uh, to the science was given from Java. Well, uh, uh, similarly, American Society of Metal in 1988 uh, prepared a plate and sent to Hindustan Jing, saying that at this about Java, it writes, at this site are preserved the Jing retort distillation furnaces and remnants of related operations. The village artifacts, together with uh, you know temple ruins, uh, you know attest to the success of this metallurgical technology. So this supplied actually Jing. And uh, it was a forerunner of the Industrial Revolution. It was a forerunner of the Industrial Revolution. So this was very, very important information. But at the moment, at the moment, actually, there is a pathetic situation at uh, Java. What we are, uh, we are losing remains. What is happening? The modern mining is, you know, uh, is blasting uh, ancient mines. Most of the ancient mines have been already blasted by the mining work. Massive dumping of refractory material heaps are being destroyed. So this is a pathetic situation. It has to be preserved. Otherwise, how we are going to say this this area of Java, this location of Java, the myth smiths of Java, the metallurgists of scientists of Java made India feel uh, you know uh, uh, proud forever. So we need to preserve all this evidence. A couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to be part of a meeting uh, in Archaeological Survey of India. So we proposed that Java should be protected. So they then, uh, you know, exploration director Manjumji, who is now uh, joint director general, uh, uh, they, they they promised that they would take it up uh, and uh, Java should be <coughs> Java should be protected. Uh, let us hope that they will take it up and uh, and uh, Java will be protected. Uh, uh, last year, we also uh, after you know uh, doing salvage excavation at Java, we uh, brought soil from Java and we uh, prepared retorts. We prepared furnace uh, plates, perforated plates, and a furnace exactly with the dimension of Java, and did uh, uh, picked up ore from Java also, and uh, did experimental. Of course, the Vedanta Group of company they also helped us uh, preparing some ore. So IIT. Uh, Gandhinagar also joined us in this venture. We did two experiments, one at IIT Gandhinagar first, the second in right in my department at Udaipur. Uh, it was part of also training to the students, also to, uh, to train the students. And uh, we raised this furnace right inside the department uh, to see how uh, the operation at Java was done. Unfortunately, we did, uh, we did everything as, as I explained above, but we miserably failed creating jinx. So that means we are still missing something, how zinc was prepared and how vapor was obtained by people at Java. Well, this is the same experiment we, we did. And uh, uh, we, we maintained the temperature uh, 1000 to 1050 uh, degree for about three and a half hours. But uh, we were not successful to make zinc. Of course, uh, uh, the smelting operation completed. These are some of our students with the retorts. Uh, fused retorts, of course, exhausted ones. Uh, thus, the jinx melting process of Java appears to be the result of long experience of archaeometallurgy, use of metals in medicine, long history of distillation technology, continuing transition in cultural processes, and strong traditional knowledge system in South Asia. All these factors perhaps contributed to the development of underground mining of metal in the first millennium BC and production of pure jing on commercial scale at java from 12th century c if not earlier i'm sure if we, it is there from Mauryan times we all need to research it or discover it thus therefore warm salute to the ancient smiths mining engineers and workers of java who stole the march uh, by innovating distillation technique for pure jing and made india feel proud forever so uh, there are some books available on that jink uh, of Jawar, uh, 
uh, one of is my book which uh, came out in 2010-11, another by Irwin, my friend Irwin, and the, uh, the, another book by Paul Kedok, uh, Reads Early Indian Metallurgy. And uh, uh, last but not least, I humbly request ICHR authorities to allow me to dedicate this presentation to my teachers, uh, Professor V. N. Mishra and Professor D. P. Agrawal. Well, thank you very much for your attention. I would be very happy if there are comments, if there are questions that will allow me to research further. Thank you very much.